Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And as I would normally say, in Guyana there are so many issues that are worthy of discussion in any given week, the last week being no different. So we have a packed program and I want to begin by welcoming all of our viewers who are joining us on television in Region 5, West Coast, Barbies, all the way to Ithaca. Good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And I wish to move across the Barbies River and welcome all of our viewers joining us on television in Region 6, beginning on the east bank of the Barbies River going across to New Amsterdam, Kanji, and along the Quarantine Coast. Welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. And our viewers and listeners who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, the tens of thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and as far away as Australia, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And as I would normally say, please go to your instrument, whether it is your phone or whether it is your laptop computer, or whether it is your desktop computer and press that share button so that this program can be viewed by as many of your friends and followers as possible. Please press that share button on your phone or on your computer to ensure that this program is shared to as many viewers as possible. I see Howard Samaru, I see Harry Chan Ramu from the United States, I see Sally Jones, I see Leroy Adams, I see Savitri Warnot, I see Suresh Samaru, welcome, I see Sunita Satyalal, Sherry Ann Suraj, good evening, Bobby Passad, and so many of you are joining us, Dude Passad from Toronto, Kesh Sharma, uh, Omar Sharif, and so many of you, Soma Ali, uh, Bim Nauram, Nauran Ram, Ravi Singh, good evening, Gop Guptar, and so many of you. So thank you very much for joining us in this evening's broadcast, and please share that, share that this, share this program on your screen, Share this program on your phone, share this program on your uh, computer so that we have the widest possible audience. So good evening and I want to begin by reiterating the announcement by His Excellency the President that a commission of inquiry will be established to inquire into the irregularities and or wrongdoings which took place during and subsequent to the 2020 general and regional elections. This should not be news to anyone as this was a promise which we made prior to coming into government during that trying and turbulent five months period. And upon his ascendancy to the president in his very inaugural speech as president, His Excellency the President signaled an intention to establish a commission of inquiry to interrogate, investigate, and inquire into the irregularities which pervaded and permeated the regional and general elections of March 2nd, 2020, and events subsequently thereto. 
the inquiry shall proceed and the names have been announced. One name from Trinidad, a former Justice of Appeal. Then we have a Justice of Appeal out of Belize or a former Justice of Appeal out of Belize. That, that, that makes two. Then we have a former Elections Commission out of India. That's three. And four, we have a former Chancellor of the Judiciary of Guyana. So we have four persons of high qualification, qualifications and of international standing who will constitute this commission of inquiry and the disclosure from the office of the president also identifies two persons described as resource personnel who will provide technical and advisory support to the Commission of Inquiry. One is from India, and I believe the other one is from Africa. They worked at GCOM, so they have some familiarity with the politics of Guyana, but more importantly, the workings of GCOM vis-a-vis -vis the 2020 general and regional elections. I don't want to say much at this point in time. The president will speak on this matter as it is a presidential inquiry and I don't want to speak prematurely. Let the president speak about his inquiry. I would divulge that the terms of reference will have to be drawn up and that will determine the jurisdiction, for want of a better word, and the parameters within which the Commission of Inquiry will conduct its work. So that is as much that, as I would like to see on this Commission of Inquiry. As I said, much more information will be forthcoming in due course. I want to touch a little on the fact that there are a number of communities in particular in the interior areas that have been inundated with flood waters. I want to assure those residents who are affected that the government is in action mode and response teams headed by ministers are heading into the various areas affected. The Prime Minister, Mr. Mark Phillips, is leading the charge. And many ministers are out and are going to be out in the communities affected to deal with the flooding of those communities. I want to pause here and bring you in because I know I would like rather to have this program as interactive as possible. Tulsidei Mahadev is watching, Violet Sokai, Dennis C. Charan, Gail Bacchus, Shamsundar Singh, Violet Sukai, Lorraine Prashad, and so many people are joining us. Good evening to all of you and welcome to another program of issues in the news. So that is where we are with the GCOM issue, the Commission of Inquiry, and I just thought that I would inform you as well of the government's planned actions 
into the areas affected by flooding. Tonight I want to spend some time on the issue that is making the news and has made the news over the past two or three days. And it is the Vice News documentary. I think that is how it is described. And I want to delve a little into the documentary or the new story, if you wish, and then deal with the reaction that have emanated from this interview. Now, as most of you may be aware, the Vice President made this interview public shortly after it was recorded. So what is coming out now is nothing new. These are matters that have been in the public domain for months now, and we were told that the news agency will reveal their version of this story, which they claim they have um, been working on at the appropriate time. Well, they have released it over the past few days, and it is making the rounds in Guyana. So as I understand it, Vice News is an agency that goes around the world and they do interviews and they are the type of news agencies, news agency that does these breaking news and controversial type of endeavors. This one is no different. So based upon what I have learned, they apparently were in Guyana, a team from this news agency, and they spent some time here observing what is going on in Guyana. And they also made acquaintances with various persons. I have no doubt that they came to Guyana with a view of doing a story on corruption in government. I believe that any objective observer will concede that that predetermined agenda was what they were equipped with when they landed in Guyana. So they must have done their inquiries and they did their um, sussing out, so to speak. And they made contact with this gentleman by the name of Sue, who has now become very famous. They seem to have led Sue to believe that they are business people and they want to invest in Guyana. And Sue may have disclosed to them that he has some association with the Vice President. And I am not clear what Sue has said and what Sue has not said to them. But what is clear is that they impersonated Chinese businessmen, because that's what they seem to have pretended to be, Chinese businessmen. Now, I don't know, I have to think whether that is a legal or illegal thing. Impersonation, I know, when it is done to achieve a particular type of purpose, is not lawful. And here it is, international journalists were basically 
impersonating and passing themselves off as businessmen. And the other predetermined objective of this group seem to be also the objective of establishing some connection of corruption between Guyana or Guyana's government and China and China's investment policy. They seem to be also an inseverable connection. They want to make that connection and they set out even from the inception to pursue that objective. And they seem to also be influenced negatively by that fact that it's wrong for the government of Guyana to be trading with China. And it is also obviously, and then they move to step two, which is to establish a corrupt relationship or corruption arising out of these relations. Let me say, let me pause to say that Guyana as a sovereign nation enjoys good bipartisan and trade relations with many countries in the world. China, India, the United States of America, Canada, the United Kingdom, and many, many countries of the first world, the second world, and the third world. We have great trade relations with our counterparts in the Caribbean. We don't necessarily want to treat as a country, want to have favorite relations. We treat countries depending upon the investment opportunities and how Guyanese and Guyana will benefit from those opportunities. That is how we assess our relations with our developmental partners. The one golden thread that runs through our position is that whatever opportunities are offered by different countries, once they are going to inure to the benefit of Guyanese and Guyana as a whole, as far as possible, we will take advantage of those opportunities. So I just wish to put that on the record. So this incident here, where Mr. Su said to the reporters who were pretending to be businessmen that he has a good relationship with the vice president and that normally he would get assistance from the vice president. And in that, on that basis, a meeting was arranged. And the same crew that pretended to be businessmen, and perhaps a woman, in the company of Sue, visited the vice president's house. And they had a conversation. You all saw that on the interview. And the reporter, disguised as a businessman, tried to entrap the vice president in making statements that would have implicated the vice president. Now, just for one moment, think that this is somebody coming into your house coming in the company of a friend 
and you know this friend because you have done, you have helped him with businesses, and I'm going to deal with the help with businesses shortly. And this person starts to ask questions. Now, the vice president does not know that he's being taped. The vice president is unaware that there is this entrapment type of arrangement. And to use a word that has been overused already in the description of this situation, in his most unguarded moment, said very clearly that he doesn't get involved in the details of the business arrangement or the business arrangement period. That all he does is to help Sue. Sue does the business. Sue looks after the business part of it. And of course, what was said in Mandarin is not known to the vice president. It has been revealed, obviously, based upon the translation, I don't know Mandarin, but if the translation which I see there is correct, it seems as though Sue did convey the impression that he has an improper arrangement with the vice president. And the vice president, upon learning that in this interview or because of this interview, has rightly said that he will take legal actions against Sue. Now you will note that when the program was originally aired at the instance of the Vice President, Sue issued a statement and said he never made such improper remarks or he never conveyed such improper, improper impression of the Vice President. In other words, he said that he didn't say anything of an improper nature regarding the Vice President. However, based upon the Mandarin translation in the conversation that he had with the other person who apparently was an undercover reporter, he seemed to be saying now in the house of Mr. Jack Deal that there is some improper relationship and that he's collecting money for Mr. Jack Deal. Mr. Jack Deal has rightfully denied any knowledge. So I am wondering, where is the wrongdoing? What is Mr. Jack Deal being accused of? He was very forthright, even long before he knew about this whole undercover operation. In the first interview, he was very forthright. He was very, um, and with great candor, he said, Sue is my friend. Sue is my tenant. I have helped Sue, as I have helped so many people. And I do it not for any improper purpose. I do it for no financial reward. All of that was said before. What makes the case even more compelling is that now it is being revealed that there were hidden cameras. This person came to his house pretending to be someone else. And yet, in all of that sophistication and in all of that conspiratorial context, Mr. Vice President is able to acquit himself earnestly and honestly by saying in the most unguarded moment, I am not involved in anything. I don't get involved in anything. Sue is the businessman. I only help him. Now, I am in government. I am in the leadership of the People's Progressive Party. And I have been close to the government of the PPP long before I got into the government. I know plenty people. 
a lot of business people. And I am talking to them now. Hundreds if not tens of thousands of persons who have come to me over the years to ask me for assistance in government. To call a minister to help with a mining claim, to help with a firearm license, to help policemen get back jobs, to help with pension, to help with NIS, to help with house lot applications, to help in investment opportunities, help in getting contracts, work, um, not contracts, but, but, but lands, and help to process applications that are in government. And I have done that. I have done that directly to persons who are the actual investors themselves. And I have done that for several persons whom I know and who may have known these persons who are requesting the help. And I can safely say that many ministers in our government and many PPP leaders have had to do that as part of their political task and as part of their everyday political responsibilities. We have to go out there to get people to vote. We have to go out there to get people's support. When they support you, they expect assistance if you win the government. They es expect you, if you have influence in the government, to assist them in expediting their particular endeavors. Engaging in such an act cannot be corruption. Now, it can't be nepotism. You are simply assisting to expedite people's business because it is a known fact that government processes in Guyana and elsewhere suffers from bureaucratic red tapes, sloth, and a whole host of reasons that would tend to ma put malaise in the process. So I don't know how many persons I may have helped, as Mr. Jack Dave said he did. And he was president. So you could imagine how many people he would have helped. And I am saying that unless you can, Mr. Jack Dave has, has, has put out a challenge. He said, all those persons who have helped, let any one of them come forward and say that they have paid or he has been improper with them in some form or fashion. And I am saying that the number of persons I have helped, let them see whether I have asked them, solicited a bribe from them, or have asked them for some reward as a result of what I have done to assist them in expediting their particular business with the government. Almost every day there is a person from New York or from North America who would call me to tell me that they're coming to Guyana if I want anything. And I would say no. Every day, almost every day. Either a WhatsApp message or a phone call. And when they come to Guyana, they come to me and they ask if I can assist with X, Y, and Z. And I do it. They have three or four persons right now who are from New York who are trying to make contact with me because I, I met them in North America quite recently and they asked for, they are engaging in certain um, endeavors with the government and they ask if their processes can be expedited. You want me to tell them no? You want me to tell them no when I know that 
the process can be slow. This is what everyone is entitled to. And these are not friends. These are not families. These are Guyanese. And Guyanese meet me from all walks of life. Every day. Along the streets of Georgetown. I have a construction site at Middle Street. When I go there, nurses from the hospital come over. Taxi drivers stop. Minibus drivers stop and they come and they ask for assistance. You want me to chase them and turn them away? I take their telephone numbers or I ask my personal assistant to take their contact information and we try to help them. When I do public outreaches at Annandale, for example, every Saturday, which I'll resume very shortly since COVID has come to an end. Do you know the number of persons who come there? And I see one of the arguments being raised is that Mr. Jagdave is not responsible for investment and therefore he should not deal with investment. That must come from a very myopic person, that kind of argument. They don't understand politics, they don't understand the nature of Guyanese society, and they don't understand the PPP. We don't operate like that. You think I can tell a uh, Guyanese that I can't help you because that is not my ministry? No, I can do that, but I don't. I try to take the information, I try to listen, and I advise where to go. Or I try my, myself, if I know that I can resolve the issue quickly, I resolve it quickly. Can I go and hold a public outreach when 40 persons are there to deal with house lots and I tell them, no, I can't help them? I can't do that. I don't do that. I call my colleague or someone at the Ministry of Housing and I get information that will assist those persons. That is how we run a government. And perhaps that is what others don't understand and that's why we win elections after elections. So this entire attempt to create a scandal out of this tape and this story is simply a damp squib. It's nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. And who trying to keep this stirring in a pot? Who trying to blow it out of proportion? The usual suspects. So Norton, he leads the charge. Norton demands Ali relieves Jagdeo of his duty. This guy can't seem to get anything right. Even this he gets wrong. So he says this. Opposition leader Aubrey Norton has demanded that President Irfan Ali relieve Vice President Barrage Jagdeo of his duties should he fail to voluntarily resign from office so following the allegations. In an impromptu... So this guy wants Mr. Jagdeo to be fired simply because someone has made an allegation. He... And then he calls for an inquiry, an independent inquiry. But he's already imposing the penalty before the inquiry begins. So he wants Mr. Jagdeo to be dismissed even before the inquiry starts. So he has assumed the existence of guilt long before the inquiry has commenced. And that is the type of thought process that affects Mr. Norton in almost every endeavor. The, the, there is no clarity of thought and there is no logic in the reasoning process. So Mr. Jagdeo must be dismissed without an inquiry, without, a, of, without even an investigation. 
I could understand him saying, do the investigation and then dismiss him if he made it. No, he's not saying so. He wanted the penalty to be imposed first. So hang the man first and then try him. That's Norton's logic. And as I'm saying, this is not an isolated, bizarre process of reasoning. This is how Mr. Norton reasons on almost every other issue. I see Mr. Roysdale Ford does the same thing, calls for resignation of Jack Dale. So again, no inquiry, but there must be resignation. I, I don't understand. So, and, and Mr. Ford speaks about probe of allegations and speaks about bribery. And I can sit right here and speak to an organization that Mr. Ford chaired under the last government. And that organization, that organization, well, a person, let me put it this way, a person came to, went to a businessman and said that he was sent and that he wanted X million dollars in bribe for a particular type of license to be granted. I never take the newspapers. I never went to the press and said, Ford must resign. But uh, we have that person on tape, on camera. We never, we never call for Ford's resignation. The point I am making is that you have to be a little more mature and you have to be a little more circumspect before you jump to conclusions in the manner that I have seen. But it all has to do with this bunch of politicians really have nothing going for them for the longest while. So this new story has presented them with an oasis in the desert. That's what's happening here. So they are going to cl cling on to this with their life, for their life, as they have nothing else to go on. Everything is going wrong for them. This here is the only thing that they can hold on to. And every one of them every one of them going for the kill. Duncan is screaming at the top of his voice in his Facebook thing. Facebook, whatever you call that thing that he does. Screaming at the top of his voice. And every single one of them have, they have held on to this with the greatest of tenacity and we'll milk this to the end. But there's not much milk to get out of this. As I have said, I have looked at this thing so many times from so many perspectives. And I don't see what is the big hula baloo about. In fact, I think that Mr. Jagdev did very well in not knowing that he was recorded. He was being recorded. And that conversation, and what, remember, it's only about two minutes are on that tape of what transpired in that conversation in Mr. Jagdev's house. Just about two minutes, and they spent, I am told, 
approximately 20 minutes in that house. And what they were able to extract, obviously, would, would have been the high point of the controversy, of the alleged controversy. In other words, what you heard there is the creme de la creme of what was said. They should reveal the entire tape. So what they took out, what they extracted, and they are projecting it, is the worst possible thing that would have been said. And the worst possible thing amongst to nothing. The exculpatory part of that tape is not played. Even the part that they consider to be condemnatory, the part that they consider to be the most incriminatory is the one that they would have chosen, the extract. And in that, Mr. Jagdev is saying, no, 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 I am not getting involved. I don't get involved in these things. So where this, 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 this consortium to lynch Mr. Jagdev going? Where is that going? I see the WPA has come out with a statement to the same effect. The WPA, I don't know what kind of organization is that. I don't know whether that organization exists, who are the members, where is it located, what, what, what does it do? But ever so often, they come out with a statement. And you will have, over the next two or three days, more of these coming out of the cracks in a concerted effort to attack the vice president. But as I said, and I'm being as objective as I possibly can, and let me see, I am looking at the comments because I want us to be interactive. You tell me if you disagree with my analysis, if you disagree with how I have interpreted what was shown. I'm sure all of you would have seen it. Please be frank in your comment because I would like to answer it. So when, um, so they're asking me about the gaming bill. Um, he's a thorn in their flesh. Well, that is true. We know that. The story has no merit. I agree. Case done. How can, unless your hand is in the poor part, watching. Good night, everyone. So I, I, that's what I want. I want, you see, Norton and Rickford Borg, the regular thing that I know. BJ should sue, sue. I agree with you. He said that he will take legal actions. We'll have to wait and see how that unfolds. The other important thing that I want to say, though, is the approach of Mr. Jack Deu to this entire fiasco. Mr. Jagdeo did not run and hide. From the beginning, he initiated the full and frank disclosures by making the recording or the interview with the reporter public long before. And that must also go to his credit. So there was not an attempt to hide. And then today, he sat for nearly two hours and he allowed the press corps to ask any question that they wish regarding this incident. He didn't shut down any question. He did not try to circumvent any question. He didn't try to 
sidestep any question. Any question, and I've looked at it, I don't, I looked at it, it was a very long engagement. And I saw the candor, I saw the frankness, I saw the elaborateness with which he dealt with every question posed. No one looking at that engagement could have drawn an inference that there is a person who has something to hide. And I am sure that all the reporters who were there, whether grudgingly or ungrudgingly, would have concluded that Mr. Jack Dale was frank and full in the questions and queries that they raised in his responses. And that augurs well for press freedom in this country because I am seeing that someone is accusing our government of stifling press freedom. Another falsehood. Every newspaper, every journalist, every Facebooker have had a free reign to comment on this issue and on any issue under our government. You may have isolated instances where we disagree with the press or the press may disagree with an approach that we have but no reporter can say that our government as a matter of policy or a matter of system has anything in, play, in place that interferes with the right of the press to publish as they feel fit. And one cannot also complain. In particular, the journalists cannot complain that they don't have access to information in relation to any component of our work as a government. As far as I know, all of our ministers are accessible. The president is accessible. The vice president is accessible. The prime minister is accessible. And sometimes I am being accused of being too accessible. So you have a democracy that is alive and flourishing in Guyana. I listened today, for example, to the publisher of Kaicho News, and he was given free reign to ask questions after questions to the extent that some of his reporters or some of his some of the reporters may have felt that he was domineering and dominating the engagement with the vice president. But he cannot say that he was not given a fair and free opportunity to ask the questions that he wanted to ask. The vice president answered as much as he could have and even offered to go on his program, his radio program, for another engagement if he wishes to embark in that direction. The point I am making is that what we have in Guyana is that freedom that you can put a value on. So every reporter, every newspaper, and every news agency carried this story without any fear 
without any intimidation and published giving it the boldest of headlines and that is a good thing I am not looking forward to a compliment for that because that is how it should be but sometimes we take these things for granted there was a few years ago the president never spoke to the press for four years or more for four or more years you didn't have a, you have a president who didn't speak to the press so these things we must not take them for granted we must recognize their existence and we must work together to ensure that their existence continue with the same vibrancy or even greater vibrancy but also we must understand the corresponding responsibilities that come with press freedom and every freedom and ensure that we don't abuse those responsibilities violate them or abdicate them because then that's where we are going to have problems so i see the comments continue to come in and they are all vindicating the point that i am making someone said that president was a dictator well he's not fortunately they had a cardboard president i'm reading the comments that are here can you talk about the gaming bill for a bit this nalini subajan person wants me to talk about the gaming bill the gaming bill spoken about by the vice president will be expanded upon very shortly don't worry all you need to know you will know at the appropriate time so i will speak about the gaming bill and the gaming bill will be made public as i have made all the other bills so you don't have to worry that you're not going to get a full and frank disclosure there is something that i want to also speak about before i wrap up you would have seen in the public domain i made a statement regarding constitutional reform commission the standing commission on parliamentary reform as i indicated in that statement the opposition have absented themselves i believe from two meetings but more importantly they have had over 2 to 3 months to make their submissions to the committee in terms of how they would like to see that committee be comprised and they are repeatedly defaulting in making no submissions so as i said in that recording i have decided the government has decided that we will proceed i see starbrook news wrote uh, an editorial on the issue and they were not necessarily critical of me but they did make the point about uh, why no academics were not on the commission and why we have we seem to think that only lawyers must be on the commission let me assure starbrook news that i don't hold the view that only lawyers should be on any commission even though one that is largely legal which is constitutional reform but constitutional reform also requires non lawyers and should have should be as broad based as possible hence the constituent element of that commission as i explain of how the commission should be comprised you would see that it is it has farmers it has the labor movement it has religious organizations private sector etc there was a case that 
apparently was being made out by Starbrook Jews for academics. But the commission themselves, the commission itself, was constituted, will have academics and experts to assist it in the discharge of its functions. So, and, and, and any reporter who wishes to ask me any question before writing a story, please feel free to do so, so that when you write, at least you write from a perspective that would have allowed me to speak on the matter that you're going to write about if you're going to write about something that I omitted to say in my original um, engagement that you are seeking to cover. If you think that I have omitted to mention something, then call me. And if I say, no, I don't plan to do so, or this is not within our contemplation, then you can become critical. But to criticize without having all the facts and without seeking to secure all the facts is precipitous and, 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 and premature. And we don't need to do that. We, you have access to the government. You have access to the ministers. So let's ensure that together we put out the type of information that the public is entitled to and do so as accurately and as full and frank as possible. The other issue that I want to speak about quickly is to correct a headline that I saw in the Kaicho News in relation to the bail bill. The Kaicho News carried a bold headline to say that government will quash the 72-hour rule in the new bail bill. That headline is wrong. The article accurately captures, captured what I said, but the headline was completely wrong. The 72-hour power that the police have to hold a person is in the Constitution, the supreme law, the bail bill, which is an ordinary piece of legislation, cannot alter or subtract from or be inconsistent with the supreme law, it will become illegal, unconstitutional. So the bail bill can't reduce that 72 hours. What the bail bill seeks to do is to regulate as far as possible how that 72 hours rule will be applied. So I hope that the reporter will correct that statement. The bail bill cannot alter the Constitution. It cannot be in collision with the Constitution. So it can't quash, to use the word of the reporter, anything that the Constitution says. No ordinary legislation can do that. And that is why the Constitution is said to be superior and supreme and the supreme law of Guyana. So, I think um, uh, Sharmila Charlie, uh, Krishna Baldev, and so many of you, baby Hussein, I want to thank you very much. My operator is signaling to me that I have come to program time. I want to thank you very much for being with me for the past one hour or so. I think that I have given myself enough time to delve um, with sufficient details into the topic that I wanted to examine this evening and I believe that I have done so and I want to thank you very much for keeping my company and for your contributions on the, um, on the comment section of the live stream and I want to thank you for being part of this program once again and I wish to encourage you to continue to watch this program every Tuesday night and to tell your friends about it so that we build the widest and biggest audience possible. Please enjoy the rest of the evening and have a safe week. Take care until I see you next week, Tuesday. Thank you very much.